Du willst es nicht hübsch? Professor, you are on mute. There we go. Thank you. There we go. Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this 2023 Ventura Memorial Lecture. As you've seen from the slides that were displayed there, the founder of the Institute and whose memory we are celebrating uh, tonight was a serious activist in the anti-apartheid struggle, a key leader in the African National Congress and the Congress movement, somebody who in exile created this institute in order to influence policy, in order to influence policymakers and people and thinkers on the continent towards a just transition. And as you know, we all know, he passed away in December 2019. And since then, we have strove to keep at least once a year a celebration going about his way of thinking, his way of challenging the status quo, his way of dreaming of a better future and a just transition on the entire continent. Now, this lecture would have been impossible without the help of a whole range of people, including the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, our partners in the University of Western Cape, especially special thanks to the Institute for Development Studies. I suspect Professor Amina Bayat is there and her team and all of them. And our board is there and our board, uh, our chair, uh, past president, Kalema Motlante and the entire board. Welcome. And of course, thank you, Melody Williams and your team. We couldn't have done uh, without you. And apologies to our Eastern friends. I know it is getting very late at night in India. Thank you for being there. And I know it's very, very late in China. And I hope you put your alarm clocks on because what we're talking tonight is very, very important. So, you know, the Institute is committed to work that enhances a just transition on this continent to facilitate human flourishing, even if we disagree what that human flourishing uh, might be. The promises were there, 1958, the General Assembly of Peoples of Africa, the Lagos Plan, attempts that are being put together scuttle and scuttle and scuttle time and time again. We need to reconfigure the world away from the standards of the Washington Consensus. On that, there is an agreement. But how? And what are the actual elements that we need to put in place? We listened to Yanis Varoufakis last year in his lecture about the reality and consequences of austerity. We're looking at all these catastrophic trends around us. We've lived through a, a pandemic. We're looking at an environmental catastrophe. And we're beginning to need to mobilize all thinking people that another world is possible. And of course, I can't think of any better person than uh, Professor Gosh, Jayati Gosh, to take us through her lecture and give us both hope and the analytical tools to respond to all the challenges around us. Now, you know, everybody must have read the blurb, how much of a leading um, Indian economist she has been. And for 35 years, she was part of the most exciting schools of economics in my own world at Jawaharlal Nehru University. And then as co-founder of the Ideas Network, which is the hub of heterodox economics in the global south, and as somebody of Greek descent, the word heterodox just jars with me a bit, but it's another philosophical debate. But you know what I'm trying to get at. And she has served on all kinds of 
fascinatingly important committees, and increasingly now involved with the, the highest level, the United Nations advisory uh, committees, both on the socioeconomic and also as the ear of the United Nations General Secretary. And hopefully all that will lead to something. But an award-winning economist, I was there in Delhi when the ILO announced her as a winner of a most prestigious uh, award in terms of her work on the livelihoods and labor conditions of women. As recently, the John Galbraith Award. And, you know, Professor Gosch has worked in any possible area of heterodox economics you can imagine, from women and work to agrarian studies, to development, fiscal policy, to economic strategy, and, and as we're expecting tonight, the environment and the role of imperialism. So she has been since her retirement from JNU in Massachusetts at Amherst, continuing the work as an, uh, uh, as an advisor, as a thinker, as a challenging ideas person and paralleled in the economic world of our day. So it will be both an honor and pleasure uh, to listen to you. I am the acting director at the moment of the Institute for African Alternatives, Ari Sitas. I welcome Jayati Ghosh. Thank you for being with us. Well, thank you so much, Ari, for that very fulsome and, and I must say, undeserved introduction. I really, uh, first of all, want to say how utterly honored I am to be asked to be del to delivering the Ben Turok lecture. He was definitely an inspiration to many of us across the developing world. And I think we all recognized his integrity, his passion, his commitment, and the just the possibilities that he raised of as you said, of different worlds being possible. So for me, it's a great honor and a privilege to be asked to deliver this lecture. I'm very happy to know that Yanis delivered this before me. Uh, Yanis Varoufakis is another person, I think, with extreme integrity and analytical clarity uh, who brings, who tells things as they are. Uh, so for me, it's really a great privilege. Thank you for inviting me. I'm going to share my screen because I want to talk about, uh, well, as you gathered, I, I'm talking about something that, uh, um, oh dear, where is it going? Uh, I had it just this minute. Here we are, yes. Uh, excuse me for... Uh, doing the slideshow from the beginning. Here we go. Yes. So I'm going to talk, I, I, I mean, I uh, read that I will be able to give you some hope by the end, but I'm going to first talk about the problems because we do know that there is climate imperialism and I think it's kind of evident for all of us, but it's important to know exactly how this plays out. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time in the beginning to show how exactly this 21st century imperialism in terms of the ecology and the climate is playing out, and then talk about what perhaps we can do about it. So let me first explain what I mean by imperialism. For me, it's not about one country versus another. I, th I think that's very important to reiterate. It's often presented that way. But it is really about uh, the struggle of large capital over economic territory when it is actively assisted by states. So it's typically large monopolistic capital, which is multinational in its orientation and scope, but has a home country. And it is the states of those home countries that protect it in its fight over different kinds of economic territory. And of course, this territory is of many kinds. Of course, it's land. And in fact, all the original colonization uh, episodes that we know through history were about land and resources that can be extracted from it and from nature. But it's also about the control of labor, territorially and outside. It's about the access to markets and the control over markets. It's increasingly economic territory in the form of services that were previously seen as the domain of public provision. 
anything from electricity and power to education, to health, to security, all of these were seen as things that governments provided and states were responsible to their citizens for providing. They are now commodified, they are now privatized, and they are seen as economic territory that can be fought over. We have, over the last three decades, created a new form of economic territory, which is intellectual property, knowledge, essentially, knowledge and technologies, which are now privately owned, controlled, so that knowledge apparently can be broken up into little bits and privatized and handed out to people uh, for a profit. Again, uh, something that has become a critical element of multinational operations in the last few decades. And of course, now cyberspace and the control over digital access, which is a whole new form of economic territory. Now, in all of these different forms, I'm going to focus essentially on climate imperialism, on the ability to influence uh, the nature of carbon emissions, the control of a particular carbon emissions, and the implications of those and the adaptation requirements of those. Because I do believe that the environment and the interaction of humans with the environment and with the planet has, is now possibly one of the most crucial forms of imperialism. Yeah, of course, it's associated with coercion, conflict and wars, but it's also associated with legal and economic architecture that at first seems less coercive, seems, you know, well, it's only about laws and rules and regulations, and they all supposedly have a positive uh, implication. But I hope to show you that in fact, they can be as brutal and as exploitative as the wars. So how is it expressed? Essentially, the way it works is that the core countries and the elites within every country globally are able to produce and consume excessively. They generate hugely disproportionate and increasing global carbon emissions with rising ecological footprints. Yet the negotiations that are supposed to address climate change, they do so in very uh, misinformed ways, in unequal, deceptive, and even harmful, debilitating ways. Meanwhile, the operations of global finance, market-oriented finance, and the fiscal strategies of the major advanced countries, they actually operate to increase carbon emissions at the same time as they make the required finance for effective mitigation unavailable to the rest of the world. Meanwhile, as I've already mentioned, privatized knowledge monopolies. They do not give most of humanity the critical technologies that we need to confront the climate challenge. And at the same time, because we now know that everybody is into greening, to renewable energy, to different kinds of energy mix, there are now new natural resource grabs aimed at the strategic minerals that are going to form part of the energy transition. And this has created new forms of extractivist competition among the leading powers. Just to give you an idea, I mean, we all know how terrible and how ongoing climate change is, and we all know the devastating impacts. I think everybody has recognized that we are near very major tipping points. I want to quote from an earlier IPCC assessment report. This came out in the middle of 2022. But I think it's important because it said things very frankly in some critical ways. One, it says that each of the IPCC reports underestimated the earlier, the, the, uh, the impacts. And so every IPCC report is recognizing that the earlier report of even a few months ago was an underestimate and that things are significantly worse than projected. So there's widespread decline and deterioration of ecosystem structure and functioning. And, also of resilience and also of adaptive capacity. There are some irreversible losses like species extinction, extinctions. There are impacts that are close to irreversible like hydrological changes, glaciers melting, permafrost thaw in mountains and Arctic ec ecosystems. The, the polar uh, systems are the most worrying because once the polar ice caps melt, frankly, all bets are off. We really don't know what will happen. And of course, this has huge social and economic consequences on everything and, and humanitarian crises. We are already getting climate hazards interacting with other economic and social vulnerability in very many dreadful ways. 
But one of the things that this particular sixth assessment report highlighted was the evidence of maladaptation. That is to say, as all of these changes happen, countries try and adapt, populations try and adapt, and richer countries try and adapt. And that often adds to the problem. So for example, in naturally fire adapted ecosystems, you, you go in for fire uh, suppression. Um, you put up seawalls against flooding, which actually make the problem worse in other parts where you're not putting up the seawall. Uh, this is happening in the US where I live at the moment. Uh, whenever there's warmer climates, everybody goes in for more air conditioning, which adds to the greenhouse gas emissions. So there is much more maladaptation which is actually adding to the problem. And this is inadequately recognized by most of the people who are doing it. Now, we also know that our countries are the worst off. And here is one example. This is a graph from UNICEF, which is highlighting the mortality, not even the morbidity, the mortality of children from climate change. And no surprises here in terms of the worst off populations mostly in Africa and South Asia, and then to a lesser extent in Southeast Asia. But it's quite severe and, and Central America, but it's clearly the tropical, subtropical regions and the um, climate uh, affected are those that are also low and middle income countries. What's peculiar and what makes this all a bit odd, if somebody came from Mars to look at how humanity is addressing this, they would really be quite surprised because it's obvious it's a global problem, right? Uh, climate doesn't respect national borders and passports and visas and so on, right? Yet we still deal with it nationally and we still deal with it in terms of national commitments. How does it work? Well, countries are assigned climate responsibility. They have national current national carbon emissions. And on the basis of that, they declare national targets, commit, uh, commitments to control carbon emissions. Glasgow is the most recent one where clear commitments were made. Of course, very uh, comfortably in the future, 50 years, ahead, 2050 or 2070 or even 70 years hence. So at a time when all the current leaders making these commitments are definitely not going to be around. But that's the kind of commitment that is made. Now, even these national commitments, they ignore historic responsibility. Uh, so the responsibility of richer countries is not recognized. Also, they, require, they rely on the purchasing power parity measures of GDP, not the actual exchange rates or what are called market exchange rates. Now, the problem with this is that this overstates the incomes of poorer countries. So for example, India, the market exchange rate of India with the US dollar is about 80 to 85 rupees per dollar. The purchasing power parity exchange rate is only 24 rupees to the dollar. So suddenly India is much richer. Similarly for South Africa. What this does is that it increases our responsibility in terms of capacity to pay, which as you can see is hugely unfair. And then there are other problems. The measures of the total current carbon emissions are production-based, not consumption-based. And yet we know that the North actually, you know, uh, uh, consumes much more carbon through trade because it exports a lot of the carbon emitting production to the South. But because we are producing more carbon, then the recent increases point to certain countries, especially China and India. So let's just look at the historical emissions. As you can see from this chart, the rich countries of today, that's 14% of global population, account for nearly 80% of the cumulative carbon emissions. Now, remember, the reason why we are in this planetary mess today is because of the buildup of emissions over the past one and a half centuries. And it's that which is giving us this massive problem of warming already. So in fact, the rich, this 14% of the global po uh, population are responsible for 80% of those emissions. Now you could say that, wait a minute, you know, one and a half centuries is too long a period. And way back in the 19th century, nobody knew about carbon or emissions or global warming or anything like that. So why are we blaming people? Well, it turns out that most of these emissions, more than half of them occurred in the last 30 years. And we know that since the 1980s, governments have known the US government certainly knew, uh, the European governments knew that carb global warming is a problem, that carbon emissions are a problem, and they knew that mitigation was important, essential, and probably urgent. And yet, this is the period when more than half of the emissions 
occurred. So they actually increased carbon emissions despite knowing the problems with it. Okay, now how can we actually determine the carbon emissions? There are many different ways. One is what the UNFCCC, the COPs, uh, the negotiations all do, and that's production-based. That is that there is, you're responsible for whatever carbon is emitted for all the production and of goods and services within your territory at whatever point of the value chain, okay? That's what is currently used in all of the international negotiations. But as I mentioned, this doesn't consider the impact of cross-border trade and the fact that you could be consuming in a way that actually adds to emissions, but it doesn't show up because you're importing a lot of that stuff. Another way of doing it is extraction based. And this is basically using the point that most of the carbon emissions come from fossil fuels, okay, from oil, natural gas, coal, and so on. And so you allocate the responsibility um, along the, uh, al along the uh, value chain with, you know, you consider the downstream emissions enabled by the sale of that and you allocate the responsibility. There's another even more complex way, the value added. You, you say, well, if you, whatever is the value added you're getting in the life cycle of that product, you're responsible for the carbon emissions of that part. So these are all complicated, but for me, the most, uh, shall we say, the most just and useful measure is the consumption-based emission. That is, whatever results from the domestic demand, both consumption and investment, and so all of the final consumers of that product, they are responsible for those emissions, whether they're produced domestically or imported. Now let's see what happens depending on how you look at this. So this is the way the UNFCCC and the COPs do it. They say, well, who's producing the most carbon right now? Who's emitting the most carbon? Okay. And as you can see, this, these numbers, the blue bars are for the year 2000 and the orange bars are for 2019. So just before the global pandemic, okay, the pandemic, the Ukraine war, all of these have changed the picture slightly. But as you can see, the big change is down at the bottom, China, which was the second largest emitter, now is the largest emitter by a very long shot. So in these two decades, the big change is the massive increase in China. The U.S. falls from being the largest emitter to the second largest emitter. And then the third largest is India, which usually, which before that was fifth or sixth, okay, in the list. And it's grown massively to become the sec third largest emitter. And this is why everybody says, well, you know, China and India have to step up to the plate and do something and so on. There's all this noise about China and India being responsible for the growing emissions. But if you look at it in per capita terms, you get a very different story. So this is still production, but it's per capita. Just excuse me for a minute. Sorry, I was just getting rid of the background noise. Okay, so this is per capita emissions. And as you can see, now China doesn't look so bad. It's really out there in the middle of the major uh, emitters. These are the countries that account for 85% of global emissions. That's why I've taken these countries. But China, it's only seven metric tons per capita compared to 16 for the US. And of course, these fossil fuel or mineral exporters like Saudi Arabia and Australia are much higher in per capita terms. Okay, India looks really low at only two metric tons per capita. But this is still production. This is not looking at trade. Now, here is what international trade does. So this is looking at the carbon balance in terms of production, final demand, and then the gray bars is the difference. So if it's a negative gray bar, a negative balance, then you are importing a lot of carbon emitting goods. And if you are in the gray in positive, then you are exporting carbon emitting goods. So as you can see, the US is a very large em emitter, 774 million metric tons in 2015. And of course, all these other Europeans are also major importers. China is a major exporter of carbon emitting, okay? And uh, Russia, India, we're all net exporters. South Africa, you are net exporters of carbon emitting goods. How does that translate in per capita terms? This is the real picture. 
The US is way ahead of everybody else. 18 metric tons per person in 2015. It's probably more now. It's probably about eight, 19 or 20 by now. Uh, China, less than one fifth of that, 5.7 metric tons. The global average, by the way, is four Okay, metric tons. And India, really low, 1.5 metric tons per person. So you see how different the picture looks once you look at per capita and consumption. Yet the global negotiations are all in terms of total, not per capita, and production. So that's one problem with the negotiations. Now let's see who's affected by the climate change. This is from the uh, Climate Inequality Report. It's an excellent resource that was recently brought out by the World Inequality Lab. Um, this report shows the projected GDP impacts over the rest of this century. And once again, no surprises about who is the worst affected. Pretty much all of Africa, uh, South Asia, Latin America, and not the countries that are responsible for creating the mess, not the rich countries of uh, uh, the US and the Northern Hemisphere so much, okay? This particular chart, also from the Climate Inequality Report, is really important because this is telling us about the expected losses, who's bearing most of the losses, compared to the current emissions and your ability to pay in terms of how much wealth you have. And look at the difference. The bottom 50% of the population are bearing three-fourths of the losses. The world population, okay? They are the worst hit, the bottom half of the population. Middle 40% are the next hit. And the top 10% are the least hit. They bear very little, of the, only 3% of the losses. However, in terms of capacity to pay, they have huge capacity to pay. They have 76% of the capacity to pay. The bottom 50% have only 2%. So it's an exact inversion of what you need. Are the rich, the top 10%, providing this money for actually doing mitigation and adaptation? We will find out, but I can tell you right now, and I'm sure you can guess, no, they're not, okay? However, and this is very important, and this comes back to my earlier point, it's not just about between countries, it is very much about capital everywhere versus the rest of us and the rich everywhere versus the rest of us, okay? So this is telling us about emissions inequality within countries. And this is from the World Inequality Report, not the Climate Inequality Report, but it's looking at carbon emissions in metric tons per capita. And what's really surprising here is how the top 10%, even in East Asia and South and Southeast Asia, have very high per capita emissions, higher than the bottom 50%, even in rich countries. The more remarkable thing is that if you look at the last two decades, emissions have gone down for the bottom half of the population across pretty much all regions, including North America, Europe, etc. All these regions, the bottom half of the population has reduced its per capita carbon emissions and it has ballooned in the top 10%. Now, I think that to me is the most striking result. That it's actually, whereas, you know, when you're talking about it, you're saying, oh, all the rich countries have to reduce their consumption, et cetera. Actually, it's the rich who have to reduce. The rich everywhere, the rich in South Africa, the rich in India, the rich in Brazil, the rich in Colombia, and in Japan and China and so on. And of course, in the US and Europe. But it's not necessarily rich countries and poor countries. So the problem is also inside us. And that's what imperialism is all about. It is really about large capital and the rich versus everybody else. This also has a very important implication. And that implication is that, you know, it's not true that you cannot, uh, that you necessarily have to increase emissions if you want to get rid of poverty. So the carbon inequality report with, that I mentioned earlier says 64% of carbon emissions are due to within country inequality. And this is actually similar across most regions. In some regions, it's 55%. In some regions, it's 75%. But broadly, it's about two thirds is within country. And if you wanted to actually lift 
everybody who's below $3.2 per day PPP poverty, which is the current global estimate of poverty. If you wanted to lift everybody and you spent accordingly and you provided the basic need goods and services accordingly, that would cost, cause a 5% increase in carbon emissions. However, the top 1% of the world, not 10%, the top 1% of the world emits 15% of carbon emissions. Okay, just bear that in mind. You could actually get everybody out of income poverty with only 5% increase in global carbon emissions. If you could cut the carbon emissions of the top 1% of the world by one third, you would be able to do that without any change in the global carbon emissions. Now, another way of thinking about it is about finance. So uh, if you look at centimillionaires, that is people who have assets above $100 million, okay? and we have them in India, you have them in South Africa, they exist in other BRICS countries and so on, a 1.5% wealth tax, which is really nothing. If you are a centimillionaire, if you own $100 million in wealth, you don't notice 1.5%. That's the kind of valuation change that occurs with your financial assets anyway in the course of a year. So just 1.5% would generate $290 billion per year, whereas the current estimate of the adaptation needs of low and middle income countries is 202. It's significantly less, it's two thirds of that amount. So you could easily fund this with a wealth tax on centimillionaires, the adaptation needs as currently estimated. Okay. This again brings me back to the other essential point that you know it's often we're often told in our countries in in India and South Africa and so on that oh you know we need development and we need to reduce poverty so we can't do climate mitigation it's wrong we need to have more and more carbon emissions that's not true this is a false argument okay we can choose a different development pattern and there are three major things that need to happen one, you have to improve the level of energy efficiency of the economy. You have to use less energy per unit of income, okay? Second, you have to change the structural composition of your economy. So you're using, you're doing different types of activities, different types of consumption that require less energy. So there are two ways. One is that the production itself requires less energy. The sec third, second is that you do a structural change within your economy so that you're moving towards less energy intensive activities. And third, within the energy, you use less carbon emitting stuff. You move from coal and petroleum based to natural gas to finally clean renewables like solar, wind, and maybe hydro. I've left out nuclear because you know I personally am very conflicted about nuclear. And I'm conflicted about nuclear energy, not just for all the usual reasons, but because I really worry that we still haven't solved the problem of disposal of nuclear waste. And we don't know what those implications are. So I've left nuclear out for that reason. Now, of course, this also means that the ways in which we design our cities and urban areas has to change. We have to make them less uh, dependent on individual travel over long distances. Uh, design them so that where you produce, where you consume, where you relax, where you socialize can happen within reasonable distances with less uh, commuting and travel. And this is actually better, not just for economies, but even for so social life, for societies than the current patterns. Now, there's an estimate done by my colleague Robert Polin and Noam Chomsky, which suggests that you can do this with 1.5 to 2.5% of GDP of the large economies annually. It's, in other words, it's actually very doable. It's not something that is impossible to imagine. But obviously, it's not just the finance, you have to have access to technology, which I have I already highlighted as a major barrier. Compared to this, what's actually happened? Well, what we've seen is that climate finance is completely inadequate. Less than, in 2012, the rich country said, we're going to give 100 billion a year in climate finance. And it was supposed to be all bilateral money in aid as climate finance. Of course, no. Then they made it bilateral plus multilateral. That, that is all the financial institutions, the multilateral development banks, whatever they give, all of that in addition. 
plus export credits, plus any private finance they mobilize. Now, if even if you go to all of that put together, it's still less than the promised 100 billion. We still haven't reached that 100 billion. Last year, it was estimated to be about 82 billion. So it's still not anywhere near that rather pitiful amount because when people talk about the estimated requirement, it's in trillions, two trillion, three trillion, the numbers keep going up. But even this relatively small 100 billion has not been offered. Now compare this to the kinds of fiscal stimuli we saw from the OECD countries during the COVID-19 pandemic. It was in trillions. Okay, a total of $11 trillion was spent between the beginning of 2020 and the middle of 2021. Additional money was spent. 80% of that came from the rich countries, 55% of it came from the US alone. So lots of money spent in this. And yet this 100 billion is unavailable. But the bigger joke, the bigger travesty is that in fact, even this, these numbers of 79 billion, et cetera, they're meaningless because there's no definition of climate finance. We still don't know what it is. It's still not internationally defined. There's no agreement on how to define climate finance. So it is whatever the country says it is. There was a Reuters in investigation and I've given you the link because it's really very telling. Here are some of the things that are defined as climate finance. In Italy, there was a subsidy for retailers to open chocolate and gelato stores across Asia. The US gave loans for coastal hotel expansion in Haiti. Remember, coastal hotel expansion, okay? Belgium subsidized the filming of a love story in the Argentine rainforest. Japan financed a new coal plant, coal, the dirtiest fuel. And airport expansion in Egypt. Airports, again, something that is massively carbon consuming, uh, carbon emitting. How can all this happen? Well, basically, all of them say, say they it's green technology. So the retailer is using, I don't know, some maybe it's got solar panels on the shops. The coastal hotel expansion has taken account of rising sea levels. So it's got flood control and seawalls the maladaptation that I told you about, and so on and so forth. So basically, even that 79 billion, 80 billion, it's a joke. It really cannot be taken seriously. But meanwhile, fossil fuel subsidies. Now, the IMF estimate, not me, not some crazy radical Indian economist, but the IMF estimates that global fossil fuel subsidies were around 6 trillion, even before the Ukraine war. And the US, which is the right-hand chart, was at 70 billion, 700 billion, okay? Now this includes both the direct subsidies and the indirect subsidies. The direct subsidies are the lower gray bars, the explicit fiscal subsidies. But as the IMF noted, there are all kinds of implicit subsidies in terms of access to loans and you know, bank underwriting of particular kinds of investments and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you count all of that, then you get nearly 6 trillion for fossil fuels. And this is before the Ukraine war. And we know that during the Ukraine war, everybody went crazy in terms of going back to fossil fuels big time because of the fear of rising prices. For the low and middle income countries, in fact, we have an ongoing debt crisis in many countries, at least 72, and that's making things much worse. So we know that in the middle of 2023, more than half of low-income countries were in high risk of debt distress or actually in debt distress, okay? Many middle-income countries have defaulted like Sri Lanka or in very, very severe debt stress like Egypt and Pakistan. Just in the last two and a half years, we've had 14 default events, comparing with 19 defaults across 13 countries in the previous two decades. So we're getting a repeat of this periodic but often synchronized explosion of debt distress across different low and middle income countries. It's not surprising. It's because uh, in addition to the COVID-19 shock, there was this Ukraine war and the raising of interest rates, the big one, the, the, uh, the rise in food and fuel prices, the inflation in uh, global food and fuel followed by the tightening of monetary policy in the rich countries, which has caused capital to flow back to those countries. And what has that meant? It's meant that sovereign debt 
spreads have risen dramatically for low and middle income countries. So the right hand chart shows the orange line is showing you the spread on sovereign debt in terms of the basis points. The basis point is like 1000 or 1 point, 1%, okay? But it's a massive increase in the basis points, as you can see, um, for low and middle income countries. While for the advanced countries on average, there's hardly any increase at all. It's, it's all below one basis point. It remains below one basis point throughout this period. But who's been so-called fiscally irresponsible, quote unquote, in this period? It's not the low and middle income countries. Look at the general government debt as a share of GDP. It's the rich countries that already had much higher debt that went up much more to 123% in 2020 and is still very high at 112%, okay? By contrast, the middle income countries, yes, it went up, but from a very low 54% to still low 66% and it's remained low at 68%. In fact, the low-income countries have been even more disciplined. It's stayed the same at 48% throughout this period, okay? In other words, low- and middle-income countries have restrained their public spending. They have not allowed their GDP uh, debt-to-GDP ratios to grow. And they've done this by sacrificing the social and economic rights of their own citizens. They have restrained their health, education, and all of these other spending. Meanwhile, they're spending much more on debt service as these crazy spreads keep going up. Now, what does that do? What does all this debt servicing do? Here you can see that poor countries' debt service is nearly double of all forms of social spending, that is health, education, social protection, taken together. For the upper middle income countries, it's half of that total. For the lower middle income countries, it is more than that total. And for the low income countries, it's 171% of that total, 1.7 times what they are spending on all of health, all of education, all of social protection is what they're paying for repaying debt. Now, obviously this affects public investment and it affects green investments. But what's even worse is that because you desperately need foreign exchange to service your debt, you are pushed towards more brown investment. If you have coal reserves, you push that production. Chad is celebrating because it's discovered oil. So you go in for more fossil fuel investment. Even other countries that are not defined as debt stressed, but they need to service this external debt because of the fact that they are spending as much as they are on all of these social spending. They will go for anything that will generate foreign exchange, particularly these brown investments. And of course, the minute you get even a minor shock, it's impossible to finance. And so now what is called Ponzi borrowing, where you're borrowing just to repay your de debts, that is now common across the majority of low and middle income countries. How do we fix this? Well, we obviously need big changes in international economic architecture. To begin with, we have to look at market exchange rates, not the PPP exchange rates, to determine the climate obligations. We should bring in the historical debt and we should look at potentially the future shares of the carbon budget on a per capita basis. Because the current commitments mean that the rich countries will continue to take about 60% of the global carbon budget, even if we're looking at one point, uh, if we're looking at 2% of GDP global warming. We also have to have global public investment climate finance, not foreign aid, not a gift from rich to poor, but recognizing that it's a global problem, it needs global investments. Those global investments have to be generated through global means. I personally believe that creation of more IMF special drawing rights, which is the liquidity the IMF can create, is one possible route because it's costless. I mean, the rich countries can just print money. They have no problem. They can expand liquidity. We cannot. So we need the IMF to expand liquidity and distribute it according to more viable criteria. I would argue we should distribute it according to climate needs. We also have to enable the taxation of multinational corporations and very rich people, which is currently not allowed by the international tax uh, structures. And I can talk about that more if there are questions about this.
we need to regulate and control private finance because it continues to fund brown projects. I mean, the, the finance follows the markets and profitability, and it's still much more profitable. The way the US and the EU have sought to deal with it is through border carbon taxes. The CBAM in the European Union, the Border Carbon Adjustment Mechanism, it's called, and the IRA, the, uh, I forget what the acronym is, but the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, yes. Um, these provide for border carbon taxes, but they are basically protectionist devices, especially because there's no uh, attempt at compensation or sharing of revenues from these. If you did have a global carbon tax and a global dividend, you could not do it unless there was genuine trust and international cooperation. And let's face it, we know that neither of them exists. Again, it's essential to share new green technologies and make them essential to all. For that, we have to change the intellectual property rights regime, which in turn means the TRIPS has to be renegotiated. Now, I think everything I've said indicates that you know developing countries have a lot of concerns with mitigation strategies as they are now. Basically, it's still very neo-colonial as a cap and trade, which is the current way of doing it. It's not effective. It just reduces emissions. It doesn't reduce them. It just transfers the location. I've already told you about how IRA and CBAM are protectionist. And I've mentioned the resource grabs. This is something we, again, can talk about more. But clearly, now there is evidently resource grab for things like lithium, lithium coal tan, copper, which is required for the new electric batteries. Recycling waste is another issue. I live in the northeast of uh, England at the moment uh, for a few months every year. And everyone here is very uh, climate aware. They're very green. They're very progressive. So they all have solar panels and they all recycle their waste without realizing that almost all of the U.S. waste is exported to other countries to be recycled because none of them really sorts the waste out properly. You don't sort out you just put all recyclables together and then somebody has to sort that out. That's labor intensive. So all of that gets shipped to our countries to be recycled, often in very ha hazardous conditions, as you know, and with very poor environmental uh, regulations. It means that it's also hazardous to our environment when it is done. Okay, because of the way the subsidies are structured and so on, uh, I have one, yes, I'm about to finish, Ari. Uh, private financial markets are still incentivizing brown investments. The ESG, environmental, social and governance indicators are ridiculous. They just enable greenwashing. What we really have to do is control the carbon emissions of the very rich with regulation and taxation. So maybe no more moon trips, maybe, you know, uh, massively tax private jets and so on. But there is some good news. It's not all terrible. We know what we need to do. We know what we can do. Oh, I'm so sorry, I've moved ahead. But there are things we can do. For example, we can try and revive progressive multilateralism. One very good piece of news that happened just yesterday, the African Union has been pushing for a UN tax convention now for months and months in the face of steely opposition from the OECD, from the US, the European Union, and so on. They pushed for a vote. And yesterday, it, I'm delighted to say there was a 77 vote majority for a UN tax convention. And of course, it means that all the rich countries opposed, they all voted against. But because there is this majority, it enables work to start in which countries can actually hope to work together, coordinate. And maybe groups of developing countries can agree to begin some of those measures themselves without necessarily the rich countries participating, which will force the rich countries to participate. I think this is a precursor for new strategies that we have to adopt. We need more cooperation across different kinds of low and middle income countries, debtor countries, other you know, energy poor countries, energy rich countries. We need to coordinate our strategies. Why? Because you know we can do stuff unilaterally, but combined actions are much more effective. Otherwise, we are not systemically important enough. So we really need to be combining. And of course, we face our own problems. We've got domestic inequality. We have really powerful national elites. That's what imperialism does. And of course, in many countries, including my own, we have authoritarian increase, uh, rise in authoritarianism. 
and they increasingly use the new digital technologies to control, monitor, and suppress. But my colleague Nancy Fulbright has this wonderful phrase, necessity is the mother of coalitions. And I think that's really the way we need to go. Thank you very much. And let me now stop sharing. Okay, Thank so I'm done Thank this. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, just a quick, quick question. Coalitions between whom and whom? Can you just throw a bit more light on that fantastic so For example, okay, in, in relation to that last slide, I would say one coalition that has to happen immediately is that between debtors, debtor countries. Because what we have seen is that if you are a small debtor, you're not systemically important and they will push you around and destroy you. If you are seen as systemically important, and we've seen this happen in the last few months with Silicon Valley Bank, with Signature Bank in the US, with Credit Suisse in Switzerland, they will work overtime, they will work weekends, they will do break all their own rules and laws and they will do whatever it takes to save you. If you are Chad or Zambia or whatever, no, nothing will happen. You will suffer and struggle and be waiting. Ghana, you will be made to take terrible conditions after years and years of waiting. If enough of these group countries can get together and say, we are going to negotiate as a group, it changes the picture because then your debts are significant enough to matter. So definitely debtor countries have to think of coalitions, but definitely also the tax is another critical area. If an individual country says, we are going to institute a tax, a digital service tax on multinational companies, they can actually face a lot of pushback. But if let's say the African Union says, we're all instituting a digital service tax, it completely alters the picture. And then those multinational companies go and tell their governments, you please go and negotiate for tax. So there's a whole dynamic in terms of the way in which we have to be now approaching even multilateralism, in which we have to base ourselves on combined strength rather than individual strength. Thank you. There is a question that came in, but mm -hmm. somebody who ends the question with, what should I tell my students they should do? And the question is basically despairing. And within South Africa, the ANC seems to have given up on any kind of serious action on climate change, and in fact, largely doubled down on the existing economic structure and energy mix, trying to more of the same our way out of crisis. No other political party seems particularly interested in addressing the structural conditions in a green way either. And of course, many among South Africa's ruling elites, like elsewhere, have direct and indirect interests in brown economic activity, as you recognized. What points of leverage can we have is the desperate question from an anonymous attendee. Yeah, this is, you know, I mean, what's true in South Africa is true pretty much everywhere. Yes, uh, we see this in most of our countries, especially, let's say, the BRICS Plus group and so on. And you certainly see it also in these rich advanced economies where there's a tendency the minute, let's say, global oil prices rise, there's a knee jerk reaction to somehow protect fossil fuel and so on and so forth. I think it's not just about mitigation and it's not just about, uh, you know, the long term and medium term. I think it's important for enough noise to be made about certain types of subsidies and how they are playing out and who is actually benefiting from them. Many times I believe people within countries are not fully aware about who benefits. They're told that, oh yes, if you want a reasonable price of let's say transport in your city, you will have to have this kind of fossil fuel subsidy, which is simply not true. It's quite often the case that in fact, the exchequer is still bearing that burden, but the subsidy is going entirely to a private producer or, or even a multinational investor. I think we need to expose a lot more in terms of who benefits finally and break down the myths about how this would lead to a dramatic increase in cost of living for ordinary people. There are political choices being made and the way it's presented is often as if, no, it's either this or that, whereas we tend to, uh, and we fall for that instead of interrogating that and making that much more evident in the public domain. So here again, I think coalitions are important nationally. I think we need 
coalitions of people whom we wouldn't necessarily agree with on all issues. We need different mm. kinds of issue-based coalition. And mm. that means being willing to work with people, sometimes, dare I say it, hold your nose and work with people whom you mm. wouldn't work with otherwise, because there are issues that matter on which they will agree with you. Yeah, yes. ne next question's coming up. Uh, Lavelani Mano is asking, what are other ways of going green? Because wind and solar can go to zero depending on weather. And example, if there are storms and the storms are increasing and the floods are increasing. So what other, are there other ways of going green? I believe that the new renewable technologies, it doesn't matter if you get direct sunlight. That's the, that's the brilliance of the Chinese engagement with the new renewable technologies. That in fact, solar re doesn't require, you know, clear what we used to think that oh, there has to be now strong, bright silent sunlight and so on. It's these are newer technologies that are actually much more efficient, and in fact, cheaper. Our problem is really, and this is true for most of Africa for sure, that these technologies are very cheap to run, but they require upfront capital investment, and that upfront capital investment is not happening. And it's not happening by our governments, and it's certainly not happening with private investors. But if you do it, then it is both feasible and viable and much, much cheaper. So somewhere we have to generate that push to have that upfront investment. There is a further question, you know, in people who are active in social movements, what should be the priorities at the moment in terms of the pressures they need to bring uh, to governments? in the South at the moment? You know, it's so difficult to answer this in one way because every country, there are different pressures at each time and every government responds in different ways and some governments are more amenable to pressure than others. So I wouldn't say that there is one rule for this, but I do believe that the urgency of mitigation has been completely lost not just in South Africa or in India, it's been lost everywhere. Every single country has forgotten about the urgency of mitigation. But you know, we're all facing the consequences and it's th these consequences are huge. So I think we really need to focus on short-term measures that are compatible with medium-term mitigation. Right now, what happens is that there's a medium-term commitment to mitigation and in the short-term governments do the exact opposite because you know they need to meet some constituency or they want to placate some investor or whatever. And we allow this to happen. So I think that inconsistency between the short and the medium term in terms of mitigation efforts is really important because you know honestly, this is a huge, big problem. And we somehow we've forgotten. Three or four years ago, people were more aware of it, but as the problem gets worse, it's almost like everyone gets defeatist and saying, it can't be done, nothing can happen, so we just forget about it, which is not the way to go. It can still be salvaged. Uh, also, there is a, a tendency of, you know, at the moment of the middle classes and the more wealthy middle classes and the upper classes to go green privately, getting out of the public, um, public grids in order to ameliorate their own personal um, kind of uh, issues. Whereas, as you showed there in the in, in your lecture, you know that the burden is on the poor at the moment. Absolutely, but, the burden, I, I, as I showed in one of the graphs, the burden is completely on the poor. Uh, the bottom half of the global population is bearing seventy five percent of the costs, and of course, we are seeing this happen everywhere as we speak. Right, floods in Pakistan, ravaging agricultural changes in large parts of Africa, and so on and so forth. So we know that the bur burden is borne by the poor. Uh, we know that the, um, the tendency of the elites is to uh, hedge their bets and provide their own insurance policies in a way, as you say. You know, and it occurs in all kinds of ways. It occurs with the extremely wealthy of the world going and living in New Zealand and so on and so forth. We definitely have to have wealth taxes, ideally a global wealth tax, but before that national wealth taxes. And we need to make sure that those are used to finance the required transitions. Now, uh, I noticed that there was a question in the Q&A that I'm 
contradicting myself by saying that uh, you know I, I, the rich countries bear the burden of this, but they are not going to do it. And and I'm now I'm saying that it's national strategies and technology and finance. Let me put it this way: we definitely have to have the technology and the finance. It's not going to happen without it. Where do we get the finance? Ideally, and in, in terms of all economic justice, the rich countries should provide it. What do we do if they don't provide it? Which we know they won't. They haven't done it so far. They're not suddenly going to become Mother Teresa and say, yes, yes, we're going to be giving you finance. What do we do? We, number one, ensure we can raise our own public resources from multinationals and rich people, which is why you need a reform of the global taxation arrangements. And that's why the African Union move for you and tax convention is so important. Number two, we form coalitions so that we're not unfairly and unjustly paying huge amounts in debt service that we could be putting into our own adaptation and mitigation needs or in meeting our sustainable development goals. And number three, we create conditions whereby the rich countries recognize that if they do not provide some of this finance, they will be the losers. And you cannot do that on your own. You cannot do that by being South Africa and saying, I don't trust you. You have to actually be operating in groups of countries. So we have to recognize that the geopolitics and the global imbalances of power are such that rich country governments are not going to suddenly become nice. We need partners and allies and coalitions with people in advanced economies. But we also need to create, if you like, changes in the relative bargaining power. And we can only, only do that with coalitions among ourselves. Yeah, uh, questions are coming in fast now. <laughs> you know, in, a high, in a high employment environment, in, high un, in a high employment environment, how do we address the unemployment related to phasing out coal mining, for instance? Okay, I think. Yeah, you know, I think part of the problem is that we have such a limited vision about the ways in which employment can be created. One of the uh, most, I mean, renewable energies also create employment. We shouldn't forget that. And in fact, my colleague Bob Poulin does a lot of work on this. In the net where you actually re shift from, you know, let's say fossil coal and other fossil fuel to renewables, you generate on average, I think, um, I forget the exact number of jobs, but there's a net increase in jobs in pretty much all the countries that they looked at. And I think South Africa was one of the countries that they studied as well. But in addition to that, you know, it doesn't have to be only in the old types of sectors of extractive industries or even manufacturing. These are not the jobs of the future. These are production of the future, but they will require less and less jobs. We know that. We have to be thinking of newer jobs. And to me, the employment of the future will be focused on the care industries and the creative industries. That's where most employment is likely to be newly generated. We should be focusing on public investment that expands care activities, good quality employment in care activities and in the creative industries, because that improves quality of life, that enables you know, just better living for everybody but it also provides employment to young people. Governments, but also people, societies, have to be thinking more creatively about employment generation. Okay, the next one is what measures can we take? Because here in South Africa, there is load shedding, uh, blackouts, called, and it costs the country about 13 billion to run. Uh, are there other ways of mitigating this effect and move to green? Yeah, well, you know, what's happening with the South African electricity sector is such a complex thing, which is so um, uh, complicated by past corruption, current, uh, you know, regulatory tangles, and let's face it, a big mess, that it's a major reform that requires many things. It and, I, and I don't want to venture into that particular rabbit hole, because I know that you know, the South African electricity sector, it's, it's a whole different deal. But I will say that there are countries that are increasingly shifting to much, much, much greater reliance on renewables in a doable way. And it's not just China, which is, of course, the classic and excellent example of this. 
but there are other countries in Southeast Asia that are doing it. Indonesia is moving more and more to that. There are cities that are opting for these patterns. It is possible to shift towards a more renewable based, donut based sort of model, especially of urban agglomerations that other countries can look to and adopt. Okay. Uh, brief question is IMF loan uptake the correct route to mitigate genera uh, generation loss? I have yet to find an example of where the IMF loan helped in such a circumstance. I personally do not think it would benefit either South Africa or the electricity sector at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Please, can we have uh, the citation for the data shared that 50% of the poorest on the planet are bearing 75% of the cost yes. of climate change? So this so is really the climate, important. I will put it in the chat. This is the climate inequality. Well, I, should I do it to everybody? Uh, sure. Everyone, yeah. okay. This is the climate inequality report of the World Inequality Lab, Paris. And uh, if you just do a Google, I'm sure it'll search, it'll come out. I can search for it for you, but it'll it'll be simple. It'll it's easy to get if you just Google it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Roland Gam, um, the hard swing right of politics in Europe shows that the hegemonic neoliberal order has failed to lift up a majority of the world's citizens. The owners of capital continue to suck away all the profits, and um, and. Um, and bullshit jobs are on the increase. We can also see this in the transition away from internal combustion engines. Brackets, Africa is dying with the scramble for transition minerals and the, uh, and the scramble for gas following the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Transitions are still very colonial in nature. Africa and the global South's priorities are still not taken seriously. What concrete measures should the South make to reform development finance institutions? How can progressive multilateralism foster a demand for more reparations, possibly pay through a transfer of technologies from the global north to the global south, as Yanis Varoufakis suggested last year. It's Roland from the Luxembourg uh, Stiftung. Yeah, so, I mean, I agree with all of your statements that it's still neocolonial, it's still unequal, and I would reiterate this point. It will not happen because the rich countries suddenly become good, or the governments in rich countries suddenly become good. I think we cannot do this unless we change the relative bargaining power. And the power imbalances globally are definitely stacked against us, but they're also stacked against us because we do not operate together. I mean, G77 as a group doesn't exist anymore. I think the African Union is the, is the actual regional union that shows the most promise, but we are finding a regional grouping in Latin America coming up that also has promise, except Argentina, of course, is a bit of a disaster, but there is tax cooperation among the major countries in Latin America. There are attempts to think of a trade uh, grouping that will actually also do currency arrangements. So these are groups that can operate to put pressure in a way that an individual country cannot. I think that's one. The second is that we also need coalitions with like-minded people in the global north and a recognition among citizens of the global north that this is also against them. It's not just, you know, the U.S. versus everybody in Africa and so on. No, it's people in the U.S. Remember, in fact, they have also the bottom half of the population, as was mentioned earlier, have also suffered, have also seen their lives hollowed out and communities destroyed and so on and so forth. And what we need to do is make them recognize that the system is operating against them just as much as it is against most of the people in the, the South. And it's the elites that are benefiting everywhere. And only then can we get the kind of coalitions that will put pressure on Northern governments, along with the pressure at the multilateral level. Good, and in on my cell phone, what about IPSA and what about BRICS is the question. You know, I mean, as I said, I've been talking about coalitions. Let's face it, BRICS. I mean, a lot of the people, a lot of the governments in the new BRICS, the BRICS plus, a lot of those governments are not particularly uh, <laughs> desirable governments, shall we say? I mean, the Saudi Arabia, UAE, fossil fuel exporters, and and people in and others others in there. Uh, my own government, India, not exactly the best 
example right now. But as I said, where there's a necessity for a coalition and on issue-based coalitions, you work together. These are all countries that voted in a good way for the UN tax convention, including my own government, which is a terrible government in most other ways, but it did have a very positive role for the UN tax convention. So for that, yes, a coalition works. Similarly, when we're looking at debt, maybe you have to get together with all kinds of really horrible regimes, but who are also debt stressed and who recognize. In other words, I think we have to be much more pragmatic in our coalitions and more issue-based in our coalitions. But we also have to go beyond the states themselves to get many more people in the rich countries to be on our side. Uh, again, on the, on the cell phone rather than on the, the chat. Um, you know, the, the, you mentioned uh, TRIPS. Mm -hmm. What should be done there in the renegotiation of TRIPS agreements? The TRIPS agreement has got ridiculous notions of what can be allowed and not allowed. The original TRIPS agreement had pretty extensive provisions for compulsory licensing and parallel imports. These have been progressively watered down and more or less eliminated to the point where even during the pandemic, we couldn't get a proper waiver on patent rights for new necessary technologies. We are going to need these more and more now, not just for health, but for climate change. We're going to need these new technologies. So we need protection from the kinds of immediate litigation that happens when countries try and make their, basically adapt the existing technologies to make it themselves. Immediately you get sued in some international arbitration court and so on. So I think it's important for us to recognize that we have to fundamentally go back at, at the very least to the original way in which the TRIPS was formulated, in which it was countries were enabled to access technologies without these very, very limiting conditions under situations of development, national uh, strategic requirement, and other kinds of crises, health crises, and so on and so forth. Thank you. I don't see any... Uh... Well, it's nice to be ending at a, at a right time, so that seems reasonable. Yeah. How, you know, I think you've answered the how can BRICS work as a coalition yes. to combat uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have. So, I think, thank you very much. Do you want to make a closing statement of hope? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I thought you were going to do that, Ari. That's cheating. <laughs> uh, my, <laughs> my closing statement would really be that, you know, it looks very terrifying and very terrible. And it looks as if there is uh, often feels as if there's no hope and we're hurtling towards disaster and so on. But I do believe that... Um, I mean, you know, ultimately you have to ask yourself whether you think humanity will stay, step back from the abyss or it won't. And I think it will. I think it can, which really means that changes can occur if everybody stays committed to changes. Those who really want progressive change stay committed. And also the change often comes from directions that we don't expect. It doesn't necessarily mean that the place we're looking for for the positive change will be the source of that change. So we have to be prepared for positive changes to come from all sorts of directions. Well, thank you. <laughs> I think, you know, thank you for the thought-provoking um, challenge. Thank you for making time uh, for us to think together um, through these pressing, pressing issues. And please, we'll have to keep in touch. Yes. You know, the commitment of the Institute for African Alternatives is to explore, explore possibilities, alternatives, coalition building, you know, and try and think mm -hmm. cleverly these times of devastating catastrophic uh, trends. You know, I would like to thank everybody who has come here and participated. I'd like to thank the Turok family that I've realized now they're with us and still with us. It's wonderful to have you here. Mm -hmm. Thank you uh, to Roland Gam from uh, the, uh, the Luxembourg Stiftung for, for being here with us. I've noticed that 
Uh, Tony Ehrenreich is here from the IFA board. I did not mention him at the beginning. Thank you for being here. And thank you for Un um, University of Western Cape for, for the technological and emotional and caring support to make this lecture possible. Thank you. I think we have a mountain to climb, but we will. Thank you, Jati. Thanks. Thank you, Ari. Thank you for having me. Yeah. <laughs>